So my name is David Gordon. I am the program manager or product manager for infrastructure products at Ping Identity. Basically, that covers anything that Ping Identity de develops that is deployed on premise, which is kind of, you know, in, in some of these talks, it's a little uh, bit of a, sure an anachronism, but, uh, but that's okay. Uh, there, there's still some good stuff as, as people go out to build APIs and to, to bring identity and security together. And really, the way we feel at Ping Identity is that identity is one of those missing links within API security. And we'll, we'll talk through about what that means. Um, additionally, uh, based on some of the earlier conversations, there's a really great talk about tokens. I'd love to answer questions about tokens. I actually know quite a bit about the different kinds, OAuth, OpenID Connect, SAML, anything like that. We can talk about tokens. What our agenda looks like today is we'll talk about what I see are the four elements of API security that will really benefit from having identity integrated into them. And then, of course, we'll go through and talk about what API security with identity looks like and, and using modern identity standards. And then, of course, we'll talk about what those modern identity standards are. And last, we'll draw some conclusions. So first, let's take a look at the four elements of API security. Um, you know, typically, in an API uh, interaction, you have some sort of a client, and that client is, of course, calling an API. The first thing that you would need to do is handle authentication, which, as we heard earlier, is really about establishing and confirming the identity of a user as well as a device, or as well as an API client. The second piece that comes in is around authorization. So basically taking the information, taking that identity information that you've, you've gleaned from the authentication and making a decision as to whether or not that client and that user can access the information that they're requesting, whether or not that's an API uh, or even, well, yeah, mostly focused on APIs, uh, to be able to go in and determine, um, almost down to the resource level, whether or not those clients and those users can interact with that information. Then we look at the next piece, and this is around throttling. Um, and to me, this is one of the critical pieces to API security that really should be focused down to identity. Being able to control how much information, how many requests per second, how much uh, data transfer a specific user and a specific client can pull down within a session. And last is auditing. Um, really being able to look across all of the di different interactions that an API client is, is uh, executing across a, a number of services, across a number of APIs, being able to pull that together to create a picture and be, be able to create an audit log of what that uh, user and that client is doing. Really so that you can demonstrate compliance to any sort of uh, regulations that you have to work with or work within. So we'll start with authentication, and, and this is really where we start to see how identity can, can extend security um, beyond what you usually see. And really, we start off with basic, which is a client ID and a secret. This is typically for uh, the API client itself. They're usually issued to the developer. The developer um, uses those when uh, developing their application that's going to interact with APIs. And then you have a username and a password. And this usually comes from the person actually using the API and or using, uh, or, yeah, using the API client to interact with the API itself. Now, the thing that we're most familiar with are uh, native mobile applications. And, and typically, within a native mobile application, uh, that application will collect your username and password. It will send that information along with its client ID and its secret. Uh, off to some place, and that will be authenticated, and that user will be determined. That's great, but, but it's really just kind of table stakes. It's what gets you started for securing your API. If we start to introduce really identity awareness into that process, we can now start to actually leverage external identities, or identities that would be st stored at, say, Google or at Facebook, or some other identity provider or social identity provider that can be used to authenticate the user, provide identity information back to the client, and then, of course, use that to interact with the API. The other nice thing is you can start to pull in identity attributes. So it's more than just a username and a password. It's more than just an email address. You can now start to bring in information related to maybe where the person lives, or if you're in a company, what group that they live in or work in. 
And then you can start to, you can do some really interesting things down the line uh, once you start to bring this in. Now, if we extend this further and we start to look at enterprise identity, that's where we get into some of the really advanced use cases like federation. So being able to move beyond just social identities, but actually start to authenticate your users across organizational boundaries. So, um, you know, if you have a customer or a partner that you are sharing your API with, but you don't necessarily want to bring their identity information into your organization, you can use federation to authenticate those users out where their identities live. So that's a great, it's, it's a great way to reduce uh, your security exposure as well as to reduce the propagation of identities that typically go along uh, with connecting these systems together. You can start to introduce things like multi-factor authentication. You can get uh, robust authentication scenarios beyond just a username and password to provide additional security and provide the additional ability to determine who your users actually are and to make sure that they are who they are. And that eventually leads us into risk-based authentication looking contextually about where that user is, what that user is doing, what they've done in the past, and being able to make a determination as to how you would authenticate that user. So whether or not you would require a strong authentication method, um, whether or not you would only limit access for specific users to being internal on your network as opposed to external. And being able to apply that down to specific uh, resources, specific endpoints, based on the amount of risk associated with the information that's going out. So that's what you start to get when you introduce identity into the authentication process. And it really leads us into what you can start to do with authorization. Now again, we'll follow the same model where we start with kind of that basic. And you can start to make authorization decisions, basically determining whether or not an API client can access a piece of information. And this is typically what happens uh, with Twitter or with the Facebook APIs. They're really focused on that API client and determining whether or not that client can access the information on behalf of a user, which is it's a great start, but it's not as robust as what some APIs need. When you start to move into identity-aware authorization, you can now start to make role-based access control decisions, or, or even better, attribute-based access control decisions. So you can start to look at what group that user is in, what role that user has within an organization to determine whether or not they can access the information associated with that API. And again, you can start to now make contextually aware decisions as well. You can look at where that API client is located, uh, where it's coming from, what its history has been, and determine again whether or not that client can access information. Now when you move into enterprise identity, you can actually start to extend this beyond just APIs. And you can make authorization decisions regardless of what your client starts to look like, whether it's a browser, whether it's a native mobile application, or whether it's just server-to-server -server communication. You can extend across all of your different delivery methods and, and provide authorization and access control. The last piece is you can start to move into risk-based authorization. And what this is is really looking contextually in real time to what that client is doing, where that client is located, how that client is requesting information to determine whether or not that client is able to access information. Now, what's nice about authorization is it, it actually leads into the third piece, which is throttling. And as we talk, we're, we're going to see that, that throttling is really just another form of authorization. Of course, you start off with being able to throttle at the API client level, determining whether or not a specific client can make, or a specific set of clients can make a, a number of requests per hour or amount of data in, in a certain amount of time, which is it's a good start. But when you start to move to identity aware, again, you can start to apply these controls, the same controls that you saw in authorization, now you can start to apply them to throttling as well. You can make decisions as to whether certain roles or certain groups can access certain amounts of data, or whether or not they can make certain numbers of requests per hour. You can do that also based on attributes, and you can also look at it contextually. So all of this information can be used to determine how much, in, how much uh, how many requests, how much information those API clients can start to pull down. And then, of course, as we extend this into enterprise identity, 
You can start to do, again, that risk-based analysis to determine if, if a client suddenly moves from, uh, say, Europe over to China, you're going to know that you're going to need to throttle uh, and restrict the amount of information that that client in China can pull down because something bad has just happened. Somebody has, in some way, taken the session, moved it to some place where they can start to pull information where they probably shouldn't. Using a risk-based system, you can start to make these decisions and start to control how much information flows in and out of your system. The other nice thing is you can actually set down controls for internal clients versus external clients. And really, if you're talking about system-to-system -system communication, you probably have less concern over, or internal system-to-system -system communication. You have less concern about how much information or how many requests per second are flowing between those systems. But when you start to hook in external systems, you want to be able to main, make sure that, one, those external systems aren't going to take down anything that you have internally. Um, you also might need to maintain certain service level agreements related to the amount of traffic that those um, external clients can pull in. Now, the last section we look at is around auditing. And auditing is actually pretty simple. Uh, it's, but adding identity information is a great way to get a picture of the entire interactions related to a specific person or a specific user. Uh, first, of course, you know you start off with auditing for an API client, which gets you very broad information about what is actually going on with a specific client, which is it's, it's a good place to start. But as you move in and you add identity, you can now start to provide reports about what specific users are doing within a system. And use these reports actually to influence, again, the authorization and the throttling decisions that are being made. And then, of course, as you move out to the enterprise, you can extend your auditing systems to cover not just an API system, but you can also start to look at really any interaction with the data, uh, whether it's flowing out to a browser, whether it's flowing out to an API client. And through those audit logs, through the recording of that information, build out an entire picture of what a user is doing with, with that data so that you can start to show compliance. Now, as we move into modern identity standards, um, we've actually heard a number of them mentioned here today. Um, the first one we heard was OAuth 2. Uh, OAuth 2 is really about, well, I'll get ahead of myself here. So we start off with OAuth 2. This one is actually old, um, and, and I'll admit, SAML's been around for, gosh, 16 years now. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that is a great way to move identity in, information between organizations, and it has broad adoption. And so as we start to evolve into some of the newer standards, the combination of OAuth and SAML is actually very, very powerful for the enterprise. Now, the last standard we'll look at is OpenID Connect. Um, OpenID Connect is actually uh, an emerging standard. We heard mention of, of one of the parts of it related to the JSON web token. Um, that's just one part of actually a larger standard that provides a great system for tokenization that, that was described, uh, including rotation of keys, uh, encryption, and signing that are all available within uh, this standard and, and can provide a great container for combining both identity as well as access tokens. So we'll look at OAuth 2. Um, OAuth 2 is really an authorization standard, but it's not your traditional authorization. It's really about delegating access to an API client on behalf of a resource owner. So if I'm the resource owner and I have an API client, the resource server is going to ask me, can I let this API client access the information that it's requesting? And this all happens within an authorization server. That authorization server takes that decision and issues an access token if I agree to it. And so it's more about me granting authorization to the API client uh, rather than being able to make access control decisions. Of course, we talked about SAML. SAML is, is really about enabling federation and authentication across domains. So if you don't have all of your users, you can't store all of your users on-premise uh, within a directory or within a database because some of those users are coming in from customers or partners or even some consumers. You can use SAML through federation to connect out to where those identities live to delegate authentication down to that place. And that's really so that you don't have to duplicate those identities. Um, what that means is if, for example, an identity is lost or, or if, if somebody breaks in and steals identities from your system, 
you don't have to worry about going and telling your customers and your partners that they have to now reset and restore all of their identities because, because that's all done through federation. They have their own secure identity store, you have your own I secure identity store. And so it's really about preventing the, the duplication of identities so that there's one single place to go for that uh, identity source of record. Now the last standard that we'll talk about is OpenID Connect. And OpenID Connect really marries both of these standards together. It takes OAuth 2 at its core, and it takes the federation capabilities from SAML and actually modernizes them. There, there are some real disadvantages, or really, um, not disadvantages, but, but administrative overhead that comes with SAML because it's an older standard. And so they took the lessons learned from implementing SAML and working with it for the last 10 to 15 years, and they've really modernized and updated it. And, and that's what OpenID Connect has come out with. Now, OpenID Connect, if you look at the OpenID Connect token, it's actually a combination of two tokens. There's an identity token, this is the JSON web token, and then there's an OAuth access token. And those tokens could be moved around so that clients, uh, API clients, can actually start to access identity information if it's necessary, as well as there are flows to enable federation across domains. It also adds some, some goodness around maintaining those connections. If you're, if you're familiar with SAML, there is a constant dance every year, really, with updating certificates. And what OpenID Connect does is actually reduces that exchange of metadata and exchange of certificates that happens yearly. You can actually start to roll certificates by the minute if you wanted to because of how OpenID Connect is, is developed. And so it's actually emerging as a much more secure federation standard. It just doesn't have the same level of adoption yet. So in conclusion, um, identities are the missing link for a robust security system. Uh, first, identities are everywhere, and they're expanding. Every time we go and we register for a new service, we create a new identity. Every time a new device comes online, there's a new identity. And so identities are everywhere, and, and it's really our job to try to minimize those, to, to help secure them. And like I said, a robust API security solution requires identity. You can't really start to make these, these um, powerful decisions and control access to services and create a picture of what's going on with your system without those identities. And ultimately, you can't do this without standards. Um, going and trying to implement um, your own identity containers and, and secure those and move them around, it actually causes a couple things. First, it's an integration nightmare because if you're talking about sharing tokens with another organization, you have to share how you've written those tokens with them so that they can start to consume them. So if you go down the standards road, your integration efforts are going to be much less. The second thing is they're much more secure. They've been peer-reviewed by the industry uh, and there are implementations, reference implementations out there that help provide uh, a robust security model. And ultimately, it comes down to OAuth 2 and SAML, and that's really what's available today because SAML has been deployed uh, so widely across businesses in the enterprise. But start to look at OpenID Connect because it's really this emerging standard uh, that will be there for the future that combines both of those, both OAuth and SAML together. Thank you very much.